Hello there, everybody out there in Zoom land. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum. Um, welcome to this evening's program, a conversation about the life and art of Alexander Calder between two people who are perhaps the foremost experts in the world on this artist, Jed Pearl and Sandy Rauer. Tonight, we're celebrating the publication of Jed's book, Calder, The Conquest of Space, The Latter Years, 1940 to 1976. This is the second volume in the first ever biography of Alexander Calder. Tracing his life from Greenwich Village of the Roaring Twenties to the left bank of Paris during the depression and then back to the US. Jed's book truly demonstrates what Calder was and remains a barrier breaker and an avant-garde artist with widespread appeal. He reveals how Calder's magnetic personality, synthetic thinking, determined a radical new course for 20th century art. The book, which has been a decade in the making, which is a long time if we think to what 10 years ago was compared to just weeks ago, it is based on unprecedented access to the artist's letters and papers and on scores of interviews. That these archival materials exist and are reaching wider audiences is due to the tireless and amazing vision of Sandy Rower. His unstinting commitment to the legacy, preservation, and integrity of Calder's art has enabled scholars and audiences worldwide to appreciate the artist's work. The Whitney has long supported the life and work of Alexander Calder. And in fact, along with Edward Hopper, Calder is perhaps the artist most closely identified with the Whitney Museum. Like any great artist, his work is inexhaustible and invites continual study and revisitation. As a young artist, Calder became a member of the Whitney Studio Club, which was the predecessor of the Whitney Museum. And in 1926, he participated in the Studio Club's 11th annual exhibition, which also preceded the Whitney's biennial. Following his inclusion in numerous Whitney annuals, though, in the 1940s, the museum began to acquire considerable holdings of the artist's work. And from 1942 until 1970, Calder's work um, was included in a record number of annuals and biennials. I think it was over well over 20 exhibitions. In the 1970s, Calder lent one of his most beloved works to the Whitney Museum, the circus. And um, the museum purchased it in 1983 and committed further resources to restoring it in the 2000s, which it spent years um, and it's uh, currently on view to itself at the moment in the galleries, but hopefully you have seen it there or will be seeing it when we open, hopefully in the weeks and months ahead. Um, this piece, which is a, tust, a touchstone of the Whitney collection, many of you who have been around a long time might remember this was the signature work that was in the lobby of the old Whitney and Breuer. And in fact, for many people represented the Whitney. Calder has been the subject of many exhibitions at the Whitney, including Calder's Universe, the first major retrospective at the Whitney in 1976, celebrating Calder in 1991, Alexander the Calder Years, um, which was in 2008, collecting Calder, and I hope many of you had the chance to see the extraordinary show in 2017, Calder Hypermobility, um, which had an amazing group of um, people who went around manipulating the Calder sculptures so that they could move before your very eyes. Today, the Whitney is proud to have one of the largest and most diverse museum collections of Calder's work. In fact, we have over 184 works in all media. So it's most fitting that tonight we're hosting this conversation on Alexander Calder's life and work. Um, we will, um, tonight we will have Jed Pearl, our friend Jed Pearl, who has been a uh, regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He was the art critic for the New Republic for 20 years. His previous books include Magicians and Charlatans, Antoine's Alphabet, and New Art City, which was the New York Times notable book and Atlantic Book of the Year. Alexander S.C. Rower, otherwise known as Sandy, who is the grandson of the artist and the founder and president of the Calder Foundation. Um, Sandy has, um, since 1987, documented more than 22,000 works by Calder. Um, and he's established one of the great archives devoted to any artist anywhere, um, which is here in New York City at the foundation. He's curated and collaborated on over 100 Calder exhibitions himself, 
including his show at the, the show at the Whitney Museum, the Hypermobility Show, but also fantastic shows, which I was honored to see both at the Tate Modern and the Pushkin Museum in Moscow. And he has published many, many texts on Calder's work, and he frequently lectures on the subject, and he is a really cool and nice guy. So anyway, thank you all for supporting the Whitney Museum. Thank you all for being here with us this evening. And without further ado, Jed Pearl and Sandy Rower. Thank you. I'm waiting for Jed to come on. I'm here. Ah, <laughs> good afternoon, Jed. Thank you, Adam. Adam, that was really nice. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> Jed, <laughs> should, where, seen <laughs> sure. where should we begin? Well, just because Adam was talking about the Whitney, we might begin at the end of the second volume of my biography of Calder, because the book actually ends at the Whitney. I mean, Calder is back in New York in the fall of 76 uh, for this huge show, which his great old friend Gene Lippmann has organized at the Whitney. And he's, he's you know, a full of energy. He's down in Washington. Uh, making final plans for a major work, a wonderful stable at the Hart office building. Uh, They're gonna revive uh, a, a, a chamber opera he had done in the thirties. And he's staying with Sandy's mother and father in their house on McDougal street. And he dies there um, right near where he began because as Adam said, he, his life as an artist really began in Greenwich village. He was born in, Philadelphia, but his life as an artist really began in Greenwich Village in the mid 1920s uh, when he was associated with the Whitney Studio Club. But there's this arc in the book and it really ends uh, at the Whitney. And then there's a memorial service uh, at the Whitney a few weeks after uh, Calder dies, which is an incredibly moving uh, event among the people who speak is the great cartoonist Saul, Stein, Saul Steinberg, who was an incredibly close friend of Calder and his wife, Louise, uh, uh, and uh, the critic and curator, James Johnson Sweeney, who goes back to the late 20s, early 30s with Calder, speaks incredibly movingly, saying something like, the dancer is gone, but the dance goes on, which I think is so beautiful for. The dance, the um, dance remains. The dancer is gone, yet the dance remains. And Arthur course, Miller spoke, it. and yeah. Yes. yes, yeah. Arthur Miller lived in Litchfield County near the Calders, and he was, uh, your brother Sandy told me that Miller just revered your grandfather, that Miller, Arthur Miller was um, just in total awe of, of your grandfather. But all this leads us to the, you know, your, grandparents, Sandy and Louisa, and they were very much a pair. They were a wonderful couple. It was a great, great marriage. Um, and they had this extraordinary gift for friendship, um, which spanned uh, continents and oceans. Uh, you know, we talk about globalism today as if uh, globalism is this sort of new invention. But one of the things that really was brought home to me working on this book from the beginning was that at least among artists, globalism has been forever. Uh, Calder's parents were in Paris right after they were married. His sister, Peggy, was born in Paris. They called her Peggy from Paris. And the Calders had this, this uh, at first, this group of friends in America and France, and they, were, they lived in France in the early 30s. Um, and then it kept expanding. When they came back to America in the 30s, then with the coming of the war, all kinds of old friends from Paris were exiles in America. And the Calders were like the welcoming committee for everybody, uh, both all the people they'd known, but also someone like, Saul Steinberg, who they hadn't known in Europe. It was like, go see the Calders. It was partly that they knew French. They, they were easy conversant in French as well as English. But they also, they, were, they, they knew everything that had been going on in Paris, who was, whose boyfriend was, you know, sleeping with who and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And then, 
And then in the second volume of the book, the story keeps expanding because in the 40s, there are a lot of younger artists in South America who become in Venezuela and Brazil who become very, very excited about Paul. Uh, and in France. And then there are people like Ellsworth Kelly who he first meets in France and then become, is a friend in America. Um, and, and in the Middle East and in India. I mean, it, so it's, it's just this amazing uh, uh, richness of friendships. A, a friend who was actually reading the book during COVID said to me, he said me an evil saying, it's so depressing, Jed. Here I am sitting in my apartment in Soho. I can't go out. I'm afraid of everything. And I'm reading about these people who were like everywhere, meeting people and people who meant, who were important, very important to them. Uh, somebody would say, well, come to Brazil. We'll do a show. We'll do this. We'll, uh, and, and actually uh, a lot of very important things happened for your grandfather in South America and Europe before they happened in America or in Mexico, um, when America was still somewhat resistant in the 60s to his monumental stables, there was a more there was a more welcoming spirit in, in sometimes in other in Mexico or in in Italy. Um, so it's it's just it's an amazingly rich uh, story. Well. Um... I like to say in my ignorance that Calder was the first truly international artist with those commissions all over the world, those projects, those exhibitions all over the world, all through South America, obviously all through North America, all through Europe, but also in Australia and just kind of everywhere. Um, he is, we have his passports in the archives and they're just stamped with every kind of beautiful old stamp from the forties and the fifties and the sixties and so forth. Um, whether it's, you know, Beirut and India in, in the 50s. Um, it's kind of extraordinary to think about how he was traveling, what kind of boat he was traveling on, and then what kind of airplane he was traveling on, and what kind of jet airplane he was traveling on. It's a whole kind of story of the 20th century. I wanted to ask you about that. Like, as you, you've never written a biography before. So now you've written two, essentially. I, I never do again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Never is a big word. Um, but I, I presume that that's true. But my question is, what did you learn along the way about how the 20th century changed? Now, you're, in a, you know, I know you well, you're an intelligent person, and you have a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom. But I have a sneaking suspicion, and we've never talked about this, that you learned something about the 20th century through, I mean, I'm being um, somewhat pedantic about talking about the modes of travel or the way we communicate, that, those kinds of things. But there must have been something more extraordinary you learned about the 20th well, century. I mean, I, I think one of the things that really interested me as uh, Calder's ex reputation explodes in the later 50s and the 60s was um, what I think was the struggle that he was engaged in to try to stay the kind of feet on the ground bohemian he'd always been. And uh, I mean, Calder was such an easygoing man and people, that's how people often reacted to him, that um, the, I, I think people sometimes underestimate the extent to which um, the, the sort of institutionalization of modern art, which begins in the 50s and then explodes as you have more and more of these corporations embracing avant-garde art and you have Calder uh, working for brand of airlines. Um, he, he's following a very complicated game, kind of route, I would say, um, in order to take advantage of all these things because Calder is somebody who wanted to do monumental works. And if you want to do monumental works, you have to have people who will pay for them. You have to have people who will help you realize them. Um, but at the same time, he wanted to be, remain the, uh, the avant-garde artist, the modernist he'd been in the 30s. Uh, so there are actually interesting stories in the 50s of him going to like the, an opening in Texas and somebody comes up to him and says, oh, we made a, a, 
uh, a Christmas tree mobile for Christmas this year. And he actually describes this as somebody as making him nauseous. Um, so there's this kind of um, reputation as a kind of rather trite amuser that, uh, that gets kind of mixed in with his reputation. But at the same time, in the 60s, you have people like the minimalist sculptor Don Judd writing with great interest about Calder's work. Um, uh, and you have him finding people, um, and most of his great commissions, not all of them, but most of them were with people he had a personal relationship with. That was very, very important to him. So like El Sol Rojo, this extraordinary tripod with a red disc on top in Mexico, in, in Mexico City, which is I think one of the late masterpieces. Um, uh, that came about um, because of a friendship with a man named Matthias Goritz, who's again, another one of these international figures who started out in Germany, been in North Africa and Spain and ended up in Mexico. But I think um, there was this, um, this kind of heroic uh, struggle to, to remain the Bohemian he'd always been. And I, I wanted to read, there's something that Rilke wrote about Rodin. Rilke, the poet, had, had um, worked with Rodin. And Rilke wrote, Rodin was solitary before fame came to him and afterwards he became perhaps more solitary. For fame is ultimately but the summary of all the misunderstandings that crystallize around a new name. Now that's a rather uh, dark thing to associate with Calder. But I think part of Calder's genius, and this is part of what I admired so much about him, was his ability to remain instinctive, risk-taking. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about the late works called Critters, which are these crazy cutout figures of mostly women, very eccentric, very uh, throwaway one might feel in some way. There's a whole bunch of late work that uh, if you kind of have grown up appreciating the very austere big stables with their angles, their firm angles, these late works can be a shock. But I think it was partly the colder, and in this he's not unlike Picasso with some of his late work. I think Calder constantly wanted to reinvent himself as a way of, of kind of refusing to, to sort of fit into a, uh, a, a sort of limited concept of what greatness was. Um, and I, and I, well, I very much admire it. Well, uh, back, I just want to get back to the 20th century for a second because there's this thing that happens before the war in book one and this thing that happens in book two, basically, you, the war, you, book two begins, you know, with uh, the U.S. has entered the war and so forth. Um, but there's this amazing thing that happens with architecture. There's amazing, an amazing thing that happens with the commissions and the travel and all of that. And just my grandfather's world totally explodes post-war. He's very famous before the war and he's very well respected by his community. But this, this um, international thing that goes on and eventually he has a concentration of monumental sculpture. Of course, he's thinking about monumental sculpture since 1936, that's when he first makes models for monumental sculpture. Um, and it isn't until after the war that he really gets commissioned for the, for the giant ones. But I think it's fascinating if we look at the Louis Carré show, which is his first major show after the war in Paris, and Duchamp has suggested to mail these little objects to Paris to, to, and arranges for the show with Louis Carré. Uh, but it takes time to air mail these things across the ocean to Paris and then call us to get on a boat. But he doesn't get on a boat, he gets on a plane. It's the first time he flies across the Atlantic. Very, very, you have the sensation in your book, this excitement of the change of modes. It's not because he's becoming a wealthy person. It's just the whole world is changing as his career is changing, as his reputation is growing, and has, as his ideas are expanding. So I, I think that's one of the, um, it, it's not exactly a thematic thing in the book, but it's something that comes across really well in the book of this expansion of his universe, the expansion of his opportunities, and how time becomes foreshortened. Uh, 
Maybe you don't agree. <laughs> well, that's I, I'm, I'm absorbing that. That's a. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, what do you the, mean? like the Carré show was a two year program, basically. Duchamp comes in the studio at Calder's, the war is on, my grandfather's making small scale objects out of scraps trimmed from other sculptures that are on the studio floor and starts making these miniature sculptures that have you know, a large impact. They're not maquettes for large works. They're just, he's just making these little works and being very efficient with his materials. And Duchamp sees them, the war has just ended and he thinks there's this new thing called airmail. It's Duchamp's idea to fly them in little packages across the, across the Atlantic. And then my grandfather comes up with an even better idea, which is to make large scale works that can be disassembled in multiple packages and then fly them over and reassemble them on the other side of the ocean. But it takes time and, and grandpa goes over uh, to get the show ready and then the show is postponed and then he comes back and he needs to go again. Just that kind of a thing takes so much time, so much effort. Whereas later, like the piece in Mexico City, which was a commission for the Olympics in 1968, it's his biggest, it's like a hundred feet tall. It's his biggest, tallest sculpture. Um, it happened very fluidly, very easily. Um, they produced it in Mexico, which is extraordinary. The way it's constructed is really fascinating. When you look at it up close and you see how it's welded and how they also use their materials with great safety. You know, they used every little scrap and weld them all because the labor was cheap and the material was expensive as opposed to the opposite in the States. Yeah, I mean, it's actually one of the fascinating things about uh, El Sol Rojo, the Olymp 68 Olympics sculpture is Calder by then uh, really liked, he didn't like having things done by quote amateurs in a place, but he really, really wanted to work with his friend Matthias. And so he, and Matthias told him, there's this guy here who was a painter who can do this. I mean, very, there's so much personal stuff involved with so many of these, uh, of these commissions. I mean, but the other a fascinating thing about just the change in the world is Calder's, in, in the 30s and early 40s, Calder's really, uh, he's an artist revered among the avant-garde. And then in 43, he has the show at MoMA, which is a very big deal. Most of the shows of abstract art they're doing at that point are uh, of Europeans. It has a lot, I think, to do with the fact that Pierre Matisse was his dealer and uh, uh, in addition, um, Barr, Barr had really been a supporter, Alfred Barr Museum had been a supporter since the end of the 20s. Um, but that kind of, that, show in 43 is a game changer. It's extended because it's so popular. But because of the war, there's sort of a lag of years um, before Calder can kind of build on that. And you mentioned this first trip on a plane to Paris. And I've always been fascinated by that trip because when he talks about it, he says, I thought they were I thought they were going to have a show during the summer, but of course they don't have shows during the summer. And I, I like struggled with this, like, what's he talking about? If he knows they don't have shows in Paris, so why is he thinking they're going to have a show? Why is he going? I think what happened was by then he absolutely could not bear the idea of being away from Paris any longer um, because Paris was so uh, important for him and for Louisa. I mean, his wife had um, lived in France. Uh, she came from a kind of aristocratic uh, Boston family, an offbeat kind of bohemian aristocratic Boston family. And she had lived in Paris for a number of years when she was a child. So her French was very good. And she met Calder in Paris. Again, you talk about this sort of global international story. It's like, they're meet, well, they didn't meet in Paris. They met on the boat coming back from Paris. It's like something out of Henry James, who was actually her great uncle. I mean, she's with her father, uh, who's this kind of strange leftist writer, political hey, guy. Hey, you're talking about my family. Be, be careful. <laughs> and... And she's been very frustrated in Paris because in Paris, she's at all these restaurants and these cafes and she's looking at these like wonderful bohemians and she has no way of meeting them. And then on the boat, this guy comes up to her and, uh, uh, and says, hey. Um, and, admire uh, Yeah, and they, they had an incredible marriage. She was a kind of more um, contemplative person than he was. Um, 
uh, and I think that there was a, almost a kind of yang yin thing between the two of them, I think. Um, they both well, he, loved he, to dance. He said that she was a philosopher. Well, right, why right. did he, he say asked, that? Well, because I think she was, she was the, I mean, I say in volume one that she was the philosopher of his life and his art. And I think in a way, uh, I mean, he was, he had this kind of what the hell attitude toward things. Oh, let's just give it a try and do it. And she was, um, uh, sh she was more skeptical about things. Uh, like, well, I don't know if that's <laughs> right or if that, I'm not sure about this person, Sandy, who you're like getting deep in with. Um, uh, so, so the, so that was one of the pleasures of the book, and it's really till the end is a, is the pleasure of their together. They when they go to uh, Brazil, they become besotted with the samba, and they bring back samba records. Uh, and in Connecticut, they have these samba parties and teach all their Connecticut friends the samba. Uh, what um, somebody's asking about Merce Cunningham. But he, he appears in your book a few times. And uh, what similarities between Calder and Cunningham in temperament and method? Well, Merce Cunningham, we believe, what we, Merce Cunningham, we believe, was really interested in, in Calder's work. I mean, we, the, 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 the information for that is somewhat fragmentary. It comes mostly from the woman, Carolyn Brown, who was one of Cunningham's first kind of generation of dancers. But um, Cunningham, I would say Rauschenberg, um, this, uh, the composer Earl Brown, uh, who does a collaboration with Calder in the 60s. I think what many younger artists admired in Calder's art was the idea that a work of art is not fixed. Okay. I, know it's, they, I think Cunningham was very interested in the idea of the mobile. So something that, uh, that both has a, 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 a set form, a mobile has a set form. And, at some point it ought to return to where it was originally. But it also has this extraordinary uh, fluidity and it can change and be different things. And when you think about Cunningham's theater um, and especially later Cunningham where uh, different elements would be combined at different times and the si different elements, the same elements would be combined in different ways in different works. Um, I think there's, um, something there. Uh, but also here is one of these interesting parts of this story, this very mysterious story of Calder's reputation. Because um, Calder uh, is this huge international figure by the late 50s and early 60s. And, um, and I think, you know, the younger generation is always, you know, doesn't want to uh, completely go with the older generation. There's a sense that's healthy of wanting to be yourself. And I think you see that starting with the abstract expressions who I actually think look more closely at Calder than people have acknowledged. I think from the abstract expressionists to the group of people at Cunningham and Rauschenberg and uh, Earl Brown there, and then on to the minimalists, I would say that there was a kind of sneaky fascination with Calder, where I think they would look at his work, um, but they didn't want to um, kind of be absorbed by it. They didn't want to become um, disciples. So you have to kind of look at an angle to understand these things. Um, and I think this is what's something that Calder understood. I mean, when Earl Brown wanted to use a mobile as a percussion instrument in a, uh, in a major, in a percussion piece, he was well, like it nervous. Is, it but, started out as a, as a, as a conductor. The idea was that the mobile's motion would conduct the piece of music and its motion, which was tremendously variable, could be faster, could be slower at different performances, would conduct the piece of music. And later it became a percussion instrument in, you know, right. through the 64, right. 65, 66. But he's also, Calder is, um, you know, Earl Brown is worried that Calder will like blow him off 
you know, when he goes. And Calder's were like, of course. And then Earl Brown is surprised when Calder goes to, I don't know if it was the premiere in Paris, Calder is there. Um, and he says he should have banged it harder or something. I mean, so there was a kind of, you know, these people are, there's a whole generation between these people. And Calder and his wife are very much, they are people of the 20s and early 30s. I mean, you talk about a change in the world. In one sense, they're Calder, Sandy and Louisa are uh, figures of the pre-World War II world, where there was a kind of lightheartedness and optimism about, uh, the future, the war to end all wars was over. And as and at, in the early 30s, that sort of ends. But to younger people, younger artists, Calder could sometimes seem um, uh, a little bit too easygoing. There's an interesting postcard when uh, they've met Ellsworth Kelly in, in Europe and they come back and Ellsworth Kelly is a rather serious young man. And Louisa writes him a postcard saying, well, we're having a dancing, a ja dancing party with jazz in the country. And of course you're welcome to come, but I don't know if you like this kind of thing. And he does come. So they understand that, that there are these sort of different, uh, you know, modes. Um, and then uh, uh, Jack Youngerman, who's another close friend, then married to Delphine Sirig, the actress, they have a party in New York and they decide, Sandy and Louisa like jazz. They like dancing to jazz or samba records. So they, they actually bring jazz groups up to uh, Litchfield County. And Sand, Sandra, I'm uh, sorry, Delphine Sarig writes to her mother saying, we're gonna have rock and roll at this party. And Sandy and Louisa are gonna have to dance to it. So, so there's this kind of, um, you know, those are kind of, light, small, anecdotal things. But I think they, they suggest a larger uh, shift. Uh, a lot of the younger artists in New York, people like de Kooning and Pollock, you know, they kind of come up in the 30s when things were so difficult in New York. And the fact is Calder had a difficult time in his first years, but it was much easier for him than it was for um, de Kooning. Uh, certainly. Um, so, so there's a kind of wary watching of cold, which I think is very important. And I think, um, I know this is something, you know, that's always interested you, Sandy, sort of uh, trying to establish Calder from the first uh, uh, moving works, the first works, the Conquer Time, uh, in the 30s through to these enormous works. There's, you've always wanted to, to establish the, the, the really um, avant-garde, um, profound standing of these works, um, which when Calder died was not um, really recognized. I mean, one of the funny things that happened to me when you and I first met 12 or 13 years ago, um, I had always wondered why there wasn't a biography of Calder. And I had two theories. One was that the family was not permitting it. And the other one was that somebody had been working on one for 30 years, which people sometimes do. And what I realized, not only from you, but from your aunt, uh, Calder's older daughter, Sandra Davidson, and I'm talking to other people in the family, um, was there was a fear that a biography of your grandfather would not acknowledge the seriousness, the, frankly, the gravitas of his achievement. Um, and of course, in the 50s, a friend of his had written a biography, <laughs> a very intelligent guy who actually wrote a book about Gertrude Stein. And this poor man, when he gave it to your grandfather, your grandfather and your grandmother like went bananas. The manuscript, which is in the Calder Foundation, has on the early pages these comments by your grandfather, and there are letters from uh, your grandmother. And they were just, they were horrified that, and they, I, I believe that Louise uses the word picaresque. It was as if your grandfather had been turned into a kind of, um, you know, a, a kind of Pickwick Papers kind of person, a chubby kind of good, to good times, guy and the violence of your grandparents reaction to that is really fascinating and I think it lingered in the family in your mother and your aunt and in you uh, that sense that that Calder was being 
that there was so much of a danger was being misunderstood as a sort of entertainer who designed things for overcrib, which of course he never did. No, he never did. Uh, the trivialization has always been a challenge when someone, an artist makes work that has the appearance of accessibility. Actually, Calder's work is, is quite inaccessible. It can be um, dazzling and it can catch your eye and it can uh, inspire certain poetic ideas, but um, your two books have done an incredible job at bringing a different kind of attention to him and his work. It's been really, really totally gratifying to me to read the books because not only did I learn a lot, especially about the prehistory, you know, about my great grandparents who were extraordinary people. I mean, they knew something about them, but you did so much great research. This painting, which actually sits here all the time, I didn't put it here for this conversation. This is by my great grandmother, by Nanette, by, by Calder's mom. Um, she was, you know, quite a good painter. Um, and his, he, her husband, was, Alexander Schilling Calder, was a great sculptor, actually, in his time. Um, and she was but, a good. I mean, she, uh, Nanette, uh, uh, let her recall her, your great grandmother left uh, the Midwest to come to Philadelphia and Paris and become an artist in the 19th century. And there she met great grandfather. And she, and she was a feminist, actually, we learned. I mean, she was, uh, uh, so there's, a, there's, <laughs> that, there's sort of this long line in the family of that kind of thinking. So I have, a, I have a question for you. You know, there, there's so many, I have so many questions about my grandfather, about his life, about circumstances and details that I'll never be able to get answered. Um, but I, I've been asked this question a bunch of times. I wonder what your take is. So uh, grandpa was friends with so many great architects. I mean, dear, dear friends, very close friends. And he was associated with um, almost every great architect of the 20th century. Um, really an extraordinary, you know, up until his death. Um, Alvar Aalto and Marcel Breuer, Le Corbusier, Jose Luis Sert, all of these architects, all these great people. And so my question is, and I, I've been asked this question, and I don't really have an answer, is why did he design his own studios? He designed three studios himself, you know, built, um, and he designed two houses that he built. And um, I don't understand why he didn't ask one of his amazing illustrious friends to design an extraordinary uh, building. What do you think? I, th I think he wanted to do it his way, frankly. And, uh, and he didn't want, and he may have also been afraid that it would all get too fancy pants for him, I think might be the reason. I mean, he did have this amazing affinity with um, uh, architects. I mean, and I think it's not hard to understand why because architects are profoundly aesthetic people who work with um, industrial materials and, uh, and you know, they're they're both and practical people and poets, and that was what your grandfather was. He was a practical guy and he was a poet, and that's what great architects are. Um, but I think he uh, he was. Um, I think it was a kind of arrogance. It's funny. Um, the last house they designed for them in France, this little town of Sachet. Um, uh, Calder's daughter, older daughter who lived near them, believes that they, that Calder completely miscalculated the size and that it was much too large and that they never um, were comfortable in it. I mean, that's at least her belief. And so they had to sort of fill it with, it was filled with just like tons and tons of stuff. Um, but, and that is fascinating because your grandfather, when it came to a, you know, a stable 20 or 30 feet high, had the most perfect sense of how that would interact with the human body. Absolutely spot on, perfect, perfect. He understands that, and in and in Chicago, one of the, I think one of the absolute masterpieces, Flamingo, which is surrounded by these three Mies van der Rohe buildings, he actually insisted that the work be pulled out further into the plaza, 
to give it more freedom. I mean, so when it came to his own work, he had this extraordinary uh, sense. I mean, I would say, you know, Sandy, with the early construction in um, Connecticut, he may not frankly have had, you know, the wherewithal to, you know, pay what Breuer, or, you know, these people were getting, they were, they were building houses for, I don't know if Breuer would have done a house for him for nothing, but it may be that, I, I don't know, it may be that um, oh, he didn't. Breuer, Breuer certainly would have designed a house or studio for my grandfather for free. And, and me, maybe not Mies van der Rohe was also a friend, but like a Breuer, Marcel Breuer was, was a close, close dear friend or Jose Luis Serra would have done an extraordinarily wonderful you know, esoteric building know. for him. I mean, for, you know, to trade a mobile or something, it would have been a trade. It wouldn't have been a business transaction between those guys. You know, your grandfather's last words said to your father when he was putting on his shirt to go to the hospital were something like, I'll do it myself. Those are your grandfather's last words. Mm -hmm. And I think it always, and your, your uncle, Sean Davidson says that that sort of, that said it, <laughs> That kind of said it all. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the Roxbury house. I mean, you know, I mean, you could ask um, if they needed a tea set, why didn't they go have some friend who designed uh, tea sets and give them a tea set? I mean, your grandfather designed like everything. It's hilarious. I mean, in, in, that's, in the house. That's, that's so funny. I mean, one of my favorite things in the house is, um, is a, a rattle that's also a teether for a baby. And I only recently discovered, a couple of years ago, I was looking very closely at it and I discovered, it was going to an exhibition um, with a lot of the household things from Roxbury. And I discovered that it had um, some markings on it. And I realized that my grandfather had taken, you know, silver is antimicrobial. So a teething ring or a teether or a rattle for a baby and sucking on it, you know, the silver would keep bacteria from growing on the surface. That's kind of, it's, it's, it's true. And a lot of people take silver now to protect themselves from disease, whatever. But so what he did was he was given obviously a Tiffany fancy thing for his, for a wedding present and um, some, you know, some magnificent Tiffany thing. And it kicked around in the house for a while. And then all of a sudden he realized he could just chop it up and harvest the silver from this Tiffany thing and make a cool rattle for his, for his daughter. Um, and still the Tiffany tag is, you know, the stamp is part of one of the rattles. He didn't omit it or anything. He just chopped it up and made this thing out of it. Um, it just, that tells you everything about the guy. I mean, the, the house in Roxbury, I mean, I stayed there, I guess, for two nights a few years yeah. ago and to go through all the books they had. And the more I stayed, the more I realized how many things your grandfather had done. Because when you sort of go in first, you notice certain things. And then like I'm shaving in the morning and I look down in the sink and the catch in the drain is this Calder spiral. And it's like, after a while, you, you, or you pull open a drawer to get silverware and the, 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 the handle fell off the drawer and your grandfather put a, you know, a piece of brass or something and then reattached it. <laughs> it's, it's like, he must have been this demon of activity. <laughs> this is an addition to producing a huge number. <laughs> you know, one imagines Louisa saying, oh, the, uh, the hair's going down the drain in our bathroom, you know, would you do something? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you're the only person that's been allowed to sleep in that house. I don't know if you, I don't know if you really realize that. I mean, to sleep in my grandfather's bedroom and to just have the time to go through all the books. I, uh, I thought it was amazing that you wanted to, um, and, and great, it, it speaks volumes about your intention as in this biography and in the project, was to go through all those books and look for inscriptions. Uh, in those days, a lot of people don't realize in those days you'd write your name in a book because if you lent it to somebody, you'd want it to come back. Books were very precious. And um, all of your kind of excavations of the books and the inscriptions and what do they mean? and Here's Calder's mother giving him a book and, you know, when he is a 16 year old and um, decoding all of that stuff was really, really fascinating. Yeah, no, it was very ex exciting. It's, uh, there's amazing stuff there. Uh, and, it, and it tells you a lot about, uh, like there's after, he, when he goes back to Paris on that famous trip, 
where he's there for July 14th for Bastille Day, and but there isn't a show. He sees all these people and uh, uh, one poet uh, writes in a book, um, uh, something like, uh, uh, I'm really paraphrasing, but to the person whose mobilizations are different from the mobilizations we've been through, which gives you a sense of how glad old friends were to have these people who'd been in America during the war um, back. And, and, you know, and there was no resentment like, oh, you weren't here to endure it. Um, but there's like, you know, okay, now we can get back to the mobilization that is a mobile, not the mobilization that is war, which is very touching, I think. Yes. So um, a lot of people want to know about your process, um, how you did your research, um, is the book based on interviews and letters or what? What was your process? Um, well, first of all, the archive of the Calder Foundation is, is not like a normal artist foundation. It's like something you would encounter at the Museum of Modern Art Archive or the Getty. It's an extraordinary, uh, rich store of information just extraordinary. Um, so that was sort of the, the basis. The first few years I was working on the book, frankly, I, I just felt like I was sort of drowning. Um, and you would come by when I was sitting somewhere and say, what do you think? And I would say, I have absolutely no idea. I have absolutely no idea. Um, I would say that, that um, what, what I did with what with what was at the what is at the Calder Foundation, was I then built horizontally with it. I mean, the Calder Foundation, although the Calder Foundation has a lot of stuff that relates to artists other than Calder, because it just because he touched on so many people, um, and I think a lot of scholars will end up going there, have already, and will in the future go there to work on uh, other artists. Um, but it also is this incredibly deep dive into Calder. So um, what I was doing then was working horizontally and saying, um, uh, Calder was friends with the poet Elizabeth Bishop. So uh, uh, through her lover, uh, who's, who moves her lover in the late 50s and 60s, Lotta de Suarez. Um, and so looking into that and seeing what I could find out about that, um, because I really wanted this book to have an amplitude um, I didn't want names to come up without um, your knowing who these people were, because part of what's so fascinating is, is the friendships, these incredible, incredible friendships. Um, and then like during the anti-war years in the 60s, Sandy and Louisa get very involved in the anti-war movement. They're close to all kinds of, uh, beginning of the mid 60s, Sandy's involved in SANE, the anti-nuclear push. Um, so there, part of what I was doing was moving horizontally. And yes, I spoke to a huge number of people. Um, for the early years, there's nobody alive. I mean, really, there's just nobody. Um, but I did learn some amazing things. Um, when Nixon was in the White House, um, or I guess first when Johnson was in the White House, the Calders had brought back from Brazil a uh, some kind of a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what do you call this? Dolls, a uh, that you put pins in. They had oh, an ex a, a, a voodoo doll of some kind. A voodoo doll, and they had a an a, a, an exorcism party to get rid of Johnson. And yeah. and you know, I was up in Connecticut talking to people. And two people told me about this, and then they did it again with, during Watergate, apparently. <laughs> and, they used, they and used both bigger bigger needles for Nixon. And both times it worked very well. The person afterwards <laughs> thought, so, so like that's something that I don't know if anybody had um, had had known before. It was it was funny up there. I heard a number of people tell the story. So it's a combination of archival research and uh, um, interviews, and then just reading. I mean, for instance, uh, 
Carolyn Brown, who was married to uh, the composer Earl Brown, who did this Calder piece. I mean, she in her memoir talks a lot about it. And she actually suggests that Cunningham was very, very interested um, in um, Calder's work. And she actually mentions that when the Cunningham uh, uh, company went to Caracas, they wanted, they were hoping that they would perform in the Aula Magna, the big theater at the university where the ceiling is made by Calder. It's a series of cloud shaped, he called them cloud shaped, uh, acoustical panels at various angles in various colors. And they were very disappointed, she said, that they couldn't perform there. Uh, so, you know, you find things in all kinds of odd places, but there, I'm sure there's a lot more to find too. Well, we, we only have a few more minutes, but I want to ask you, I want to actually return um, for a moment. I want to talk about the Whitney show and the MoMA show, because um, that's sort of the bookends, so to speak, didn't mean to pun, um, of your book. Yeah, yeah. yeah, volume two, you begin with the MoMA, I mean, almost begin with the MoMA show and um, end with the Whitney show. And did you see the Whitney show, by the way? I don't remember. I didn't, never asked you that question. I think I did not. I did not. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, the whole place was filled, you know, stories and stories of called the, the BMW was downstairs, you know, that restaurant space, the BMW was down there. I was 13 years old and seeing his race car was really, you know, kind of exciting. Um, but just having the whole place filled with his work was um, amazing. And then having died just a few weeks after was um inconceivable really we it was so shocking to all of us he was there he was there and then all of a sudden he was gone like you said he had arrived uh back um from washington dc finalizing the last details for mountains and clouds at the hard senate building and then the next morning he was dead um it was i mean i remember it like it was yesterday it was just an incredible incredible shock um and then the memorial service so many friends, just, you know, hundreds of people came in. There weren't thousands of people because it was at the Whitney. It was during that show. Um, but, you know, George O'Keefe came and all, old, old friends, people they hadn't seen in a long, long time, like Georgia, you know, and other people um, showed up for this memorial service. It was really um, the, a community spirit that was really fascinating. And, well, and a, lot I, of different a lot of different generations at the memorial service. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's part of what I think you illustrate so well in volume two is the community spirit. You open with a community, you know, this kind of discussion um, of at the, you know, at the war and these people and these, um, these refugees and so forth and how the Calders are assisting these people, trying to get their lives back on track, trying to help them find equilibrium and so forth um, all the way through. Uh, the community, the sense of community is so strong in, in volume, in volume one, two, but especially in volume two, this, this sort of the way that the Calders brought people together and they, um, they entertained with all these people. And a lot of people didn't even like each other, but they would come to the Calders. It was like neutral territory. <laughs> <in a way. laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are a lot, <laughs> there was a lot of passions. So one of the mistakes a lot of people uh, make when they write about grandpa's history is they say the MoMA retrospective in 1943 was Calder's first retrospective when, of course, it was his second retrospective in 1938. He had the one in Massachusetts, um, which was also, you know, a very, very important show to him. And Alvar Alto was there and Fernand Leggi were there and lots of other people were there. Um, but... The, the story of MoMA is a fascinating story, totally fascinating story, how he was kind of the artist of choice for about a dozen years um, from, uh, you know, that Alfred Barr put him in the Cubism and Abstraction, you know, show and uh, put him in all these different diverse shows in the 1930s and included him, but didn't really know where he fit in. He wasn't a Cubist. He wasn't even really an abstract artist. He was a non-objective artist. Um, but uh, really um, gratifyingly, MoMA is doing a show, an upcoming show about this very subject of Calder at MoMA, Calder at MoMA, 
um, which of course was supposed to open this, this September and now has been postponed until beginning of next year, but is, is moving ahead. It's a really, really um, deep dive into this interrelationship of all these characters and all these people. So you know a lot about MoMA and you know a lot about uh, the people involved with MoMA and the founders of MoMA and the history of MoMA and the shows at MoMA and not just the ones you've seen now, but ones going back and so forth. Do you wanna, is there anything you can share about the biography and MoMA and Calder? Well, I think when you talk about how important Calder was to Barr, I think, you know, Barr had two interests uh, or two priorities. He wanted to have this American museum. He wanted to represent America, uh, modern art in America. And he also was very, very concerned with the European avant-garde. So in a way, Calder was a perfect uh, bridge figure um, because he was both an American, but he was somebody um, deeply immersed in the European avant-garde. So I think for Barr, that was uh, very important. I mean, the, the sort of story of how uh, the MoMA show kind of got up uh, you know, on the, in the galleries, <laughs> it's fascinating because it really, it reflects Calder's ability to just kind of barrel ahead and get what he wants. I mean, he, a fellow named Monroe Wheeler who Calder had known in Paris, years earlier um, had, was, we th it seems the person who had the initial idea, but, but called, Monroe Wheeler was not, I, Calder didn't want him to do it. He wanted James Johnson Sweeney, who, who he really admired and felt really understood his work to do it. And it's just fascinating to see him sort of <laughs> uh, pulling him in and then gets Duchamp somewhat involved and uh, the photographer Herbert Matter, who's a great buddy. And it's, it's like, yeah. he, he kind of makes it a, into a, almost a buddy story. I mean, that's a silly thing to say about a show that was so important for him. Um, and then like the catalog is first gonna be quite small and he's very upset about that and there are all these things with Sweeney. Sweeney who comes from money donates his fee for doing it to get a few more pages and, and Calder says well if we, uh, Alfred Barr likes this horse it's really um I mean you know Calder is really uh uh he knows the moves and if you know it's it's funny I mean this is something that sometimes annoyed people about your grandfather, as you know. Like Isamu Noguchi, who he was friends with in the late 20s, by the by, I don't know, 30 years later, just had nothing good to say about your grandfather. I mean, some people found your your grandfather's high spiritedness um, sort of too much. <laughs> and his ability to kind of kind of dance his way. Uh, to the next thing. I mean, some people found. Well, he it, didn't. Uh, he didn't want to dig into the darkness of life. I mean, he. You know, he. He said, as you well know, that art should not be lugubrious, and he. He really felt that. He felt that we have enough troubles as humans on this planet, and that art should should um, inspire us to to resonate beyond that and resonate at a higher level, and not get all stuck in uh, all those entanglements. If you can help, and yet there's, know. right, and yet there's an incredible quality of mystery about so many of, of the works. I mean, you, you can't, you know, they kind of point to something that you can't quite grasp. I think that was, you know, again, he wouldn't have really yes. talked about that, but it's very yeah. much a quality that they have. No, well, I think I think that's a great place for us to stop. We've gone over time, and um, okay. I should mention that uh, people can buy your book from the Whitney. <laughs> if you want to pur purchase a copy, you can find it on the Whitney's uh, website and eventually in their shop. Um, it's an amazing book. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sandy. And thanks to the Whitney. Thank you to Adam again. Bye. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Jed. Great conversation. Thank you.